All right. Thank you very much for coming and going through the rain to get here. Uh, my name is Ivar Grimstad. I'm the uh, Jakarta Developer Advocate at Eclipse Foundation. And uh, I'm also a Java champion. And uh, I'm in the Java community process in the Apache Software Foundation. And I run a jug in Malmo in Sweden. And these are my credentials or, or on, on social uh, media. So if you want to follow me or ask questions or anything, feel free to engage there. So this, this talk is about Jakarta E10. And I've also uh, added some Spring demos as well. How many here are Spring developers? Yes, a good deal of you. So that's good. So I've added a, a, a Spring demo for, uh, for you at the end. How many are Jakarta E developers? So all of you that raised your hand as Spring developers could actually raise your hand now as well, as you will see in the demo. Uh, so Jakarta E10 is the latest release. It was released in September last year. And Jakarta E is all about specifications. And with specifications, we're talking about a specification document or some text that describes the requirements for a specification and how it should behave. It's also an, an API artifact that is usually available in, in Maven Central that you use as developers to when you program using the specification. And it's a TCK or test compatibility kit that is used to verify that an implementation implements the specification as it's stated in the API and the specification document. And an implementation that passes the TCK is a compatible implementation. And we need at least one compatible implementation to ratify a final specification so we know that it is implementable. And that compatible implementation must be open source. After that, you can have any license on the implementation. But the first one needs to be open source. And Jakarta E10 is a lot of specifications. And in this slide, you can see all the specifications that were updated in Jakarta E10. And that are the blue ones. So all of these received updates for Jakarta E10. And the ones with a dot one after the, the version number, they were minor updates. And the, the one with the zero after are major updates. So, so we're, we're kind of in the discussion and, and, and for the specifications to, to enforce some sort of, of semantic versioning. So with the dot zero releases, you may have some backwards incompatibility. But with the dot ones, you're always safe. Uh, you can see a lot of gray ones as well, or not that many, but th these are the ones that are fairly stable and weren't updated for this release. And there's one down in the corner, which is orange, which is CDI Lite, which is not a specification on its own, actually, but we like to kind of highlight it there because it's something new that was delivered. It's a part of CDI, but it was new for TAM. If I rip away the more enterprise-y flavored specifications, we're left with the more traditional uh, uh, specifications you would use for creating web applications. And this is the Jakarta E10 web profile. And web profile has been with us since Java E6, so it's not a new thing. What's new in this specification is that if I take away the more traditional web application, uh, uh, specifications, we're left with a, a stack of specifications that are targeting microservices or headless services, uh, if you like. And these are these specifications here that form the brand new Jakarta E core profile. And core profile is introduced in Jakarta E10. So this is the first time we ever introduced a new profile in the Jakarta E platform since Java E6. So I'll, I'll go through a couple of updates and then uh, dive into the demo. So security uh, received some updates. It's a major release. Uh, they did uh, fix some API stuff, so it's, uh, uh, it, it's sort of breaking backwards, but it's not very big things. What they did was to add something new, and that was to add support for OpenID Connect. And you may have used OpenID Connect with Jakarta application servers and, and applications before, but then you've probably done some proprietary configuration. And now we can do it in a, in a total vendor neutral uh, way uh, of doing it. And the other APIs, because Jakarta Security is actually three APIs. It's the Jakarta Security API, which US application developers would use. And then we have a specification for authorization and authentication. And these are kind of more lower level SPIs or server, service provider interfaces that the implementers would use to implement the stuff. You as application developers aren't necessarily exposed to these APIs that much. And the, the work done there was foundation for future work. 
And the OpenID uh, connect authentication mechanism is, is configured in your application by this very neat, uh, short uh, 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 annotation. And it's called at OpenID authentication mechanism definition. And, and it has a lot of parameters, and these are the usual ones I've, I've just listed here. So, so you, can, uh, you, can, you can configure your, your OpenID authentication mechanism from within your application. Another specification that, that were updated for with the minor release for uh, uh, Jakarta 10 is persistence. Uh, you may know it as, as JPA, but uh, now it's called uh, Jakarta persistence. And one of the things that they added there, which has been requested for a while, actually, and it's a neat little feature, and that is UIDs as basic Java types. So now you can use UIDs directly in your entities without mapping them uh, yourself using the, the UID uh, class. So, so it will be done for you by the implementation. And let, let's look at uh, RESTful Web Services. And they initially planned a 4.0 release uh, to, to rip away some stuff and replace it with CDI equivalents, but they decided to stay with a uh, compatibility, backwards compatibility release, and uh, did a 3 to 1. And one of the things they added there was to add support for multi uh, part form data. So now you can upload and download files with, uh, in a standard way, which you can do with REST Easy and Jersey before in a proprietary way, but now you can do it in a in a vendor neutral way, in a standard way. And the other thing they added was the Java SE Bootstrap API. So now you don't even need a application server to run if you want to just use simple REST applications. So, and this is the Java SE Bootstrap API. And I'll, I'll demo this one in a very simple application that just uses the, the uh, Jakarta JSON binding to produce some JSON and, and Jakarta REST Bootstrap API to uh, create the application. And I'm, I'm using REST ECS implementation. So let's uh, look at this code. So the application is called Bootyduke. And the, uh, uh, in, in the POM XML, what's noticeable here in the, in the Jakarta world is that this is a jar. And it's a uh, runnable jar, and I'm using the shade plugin here. You can use anything you want to do, whatever is your favorite to create, create an executable jar. And I'm adding the uh, Jakarta, e, uh, uh, Jakarta REST API. And also, since I'm bootstrapping it from, from without the application server, I had to add the implementations as well. So I'm adding uh, the REST DC, the REST DC web server, and the REST DC JSON binding. So that's, that's what I need to do in my POM uh, file to make this work. The actual application is, is very simple. Uh, it's, uh, this is the usual configuration you would have for a, a Jakarta REST application. It just says this is the, the application path, and in this case, it's empty. The, the application itself, it's, it's a simple uh, resource at the hello endpoint uh, that, that supports get and produces application JSON and, and this uh, message. <coughs> So if I want to bootstrap this with, with um, Java SE, what I need is a main method. So, so let's create that, uh, that. And in my main method, I need to do three things. The first thing is to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to just instantiate the, the application. And, and since my main method now is in my, my uh, configuration class, which extends Jakarta REST application, then I can just instantiate this one. And uh, the next thing uh, I'm going to do is some configuration. And here as well, you have Fluent API. You can, you can configure a lot of stuff. Here I'm, I'm just setting the, the port number and the root path. But uh, you can configure everything you want here. And the last thing is to just start the application. And uh, in this case, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, just starting it and waiting for uh, a control C in, in, in the prompt. So, uh, and I started by, by calling the static method start on the SE bootstrap and passing in the application and the configuration. So if I want to run this one, the, the first thing I'll do is uh, to, to compile it or package it. Uh, so package, there we go. And, and it will uh, produce a jar file for me and I can run it uh, with java-jar. Uh, 
And, and you can see it, it starts fairly quickly. Uh, I can then uh, go to a, a web browser and, and go to localhost, and I think it was 8081. Uh, and it says, uh, Duke, hello, and it's just a uh, hello for us. So I'll just give it up. So th this is the way you, you can use the Acid Bootstrap API. Of course, you can use a bit more advanced stuff and inject whatever you want here, but uh, this is the simple way. Let's look at the core profile. And th the, the idea behind the core profile is to target smaller runtimes. And with smaller uh, uh, runtimes, we, we, uh, we mean runtimes that are just a headless or microservice, a, a just a RESTful endpoint, more or less. So Jakarta RESTful web services provide everything you need to create the RESTful endpoint. And then you have JSON processing and binding to, to do the output and input in uh, JSON, which is the usual thing. And then annotations and interceptors is, 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 yeah, is there as, as the plumbing you need to, to get things tied together, uh, together with uh, the add inject, which comes from dependency injection. And then we have the new CDI light, which I'll go into in a, a little more detail uh, later on. And the current implementations of the Jakarta e core profile is Open Liberty, it's Payara, and it's Wildfly. And you may say, but these are necessarily not very small runtimes. So these are the, the application servers. But most of these you can configure and make them fairly small anyway. And, and these pass the platform and the, the web profile and the core profile. So these weren't exactly the ones we had in mind when we were creating core profile. This was more about in the lines of Halodon, Quarkus, Micronaut, and et cetera, the more microservice uh, oriented uh, runtimes. And these are kind of. Uh, I talked to the Quarkus folks. They are, yeah, they should be able to certify. That's at least what they say. So hopefully they will do it. Halodon has said they will do it this summer um, uh, this year. Uh, but uh, Micronaut, I'm, I'm not sure about. But these are kind of the, the runtimes we're hoping for to get in under the uh, Jakarta core profile. And as I said, the key thing of core profile is CDI and, and CDI Lite. And CDI Lite is the one that is designed to work in more restricted environments. And with more restricted environment, we're talking about we want to do things at build time that CDI usually does at startup or runtime. So since CDI is very dynamic in nature, we need to do all the dynamic things at build time. And this is to be able to compile to native using GraalVM. And, and to get all this dynamic stuff done at build time, we needed to introduce a new extensions API. So there is a brand new extensions API that can do more or less the same thing as portable extensions, but now uh, in the form of built compatible uh, extensions. And, and uh, that's kind of the, the main thing of CDI Lite. The other thing is uh, th they had to change, or they changed the, the behavior of Beans XML. So if you have an empty Beans XML, it doesn't mean all any longer. It means annotated. And this is actually the, the only real break and change uh, from Jakarta E9 to 10. So this is where you get problems if you are relying on, on, on an empty Beans XML or even relying on a non-existent Beans XML. Because previously, a non-existent Beans XML would mean the same as an empty one. But now a non-existent Beans XML would mean, hey, I don't know about CDI. And they also deprecated some, some other gold stuff. So let's go into to the demo. And what I'm going to do is to take an application from Jakarta E8 all the way up to 10. And I'll start with the, the, the step from uh, E8 to 9. And the reason for that is that that is the, uh, uh, the name Swiss change. And since most of you are Spring developers, why should you care about this? Well, some of you are probably uh, upgrading from Spring Boot 2 to Spring Boot 3, and you experience this, and what the heck did this come from? Yeah. So, so yeah, since Spring is underneath using Jetty or Tomcat as runtimes, these are implementations of Jakarta Servlet, and Servlet is on the Jakarta namespace. So when they change from JavaX to Jakarta, you got to change as well. If you're using Hibernate for, for your persistence, like uh, if you're using Spring Data, for, for generating JPA, that's Hibernate ORM, and that's, on the, uh, on the, that's an implementation of Jakarta Persistence, and that's on the Jakarta namespace. If you're using Bean Validation to validate your entities or, or your, your DTOs, that's Hibernate Validator, 
an implementation of Jakarta bean validation. So that's where you see where the spring things come, come in. So you, you should pay attention to this, but I'll also do a, a very specific spring demo uh, for this as well. So one, one way of, of doing this move is to use transformation. And transformation, you can use the Eclipse transformer or you can use the uh, uh, Apache Tomcat migration tool. Uh, and there are some other tools out there, but uh, I like to, to, to highlight these as, as the free open source tools. And, and these will take your bytecode and translate it for you. So it will take the JavaX uh, namespace uh, application, jars, wars, whatever, and, and just uh, uh, switch the bytecode for you. You can use the IDE. Well, like uh, uh, IntelliJ has this migration Java EE to Jakarta EE. Well, you can use that for a Spring app as well. It just takes the namespace and changes it for you. So, so, so just look for that in your, your, your uh, refactoring menu in IntelliJ. You can also use open rewrite. And there are some Jakarta EE uh, migrations uh, recipes there. So, so this will also take the source code and migrate it from the JavaX namespace to the Jakarta namespace. So there are a lot of tools and options out there for you. The Last option is you can do it manually because it's really it's not that hard. So so I'll, I'll show it in ma uh, manual steps how to do it, and I'll use this Jakarta Yuduk application. You get the link at the end, where you can do it yourself at home if you want to as well. It's it's built like a tutorial, and these are the steps involved. And I go through each of uh, one of, of these. I'm gonna start with the first two and just update my palm XML and fix the imports, which is fairly simple. So but, but before I do that, I'll I'll actually go through the application I'm using. So the application I'm using is a, a Hello World application. It, it uh, produces a greeting in, uh, in, in JSON through a REST API using Jakarta REST and Jakarta JSON binding. And is using uh, Jakarta Enterprise Beans for my very advanced business logic in my Hello World service. And I have Jakarta Persistence to retrieve the message from the database where it's uh, located. I also use a Jakarta CDI as a CDI extension to print a log statement when the, when the application starts. So I'm using kind of all of this stuff uh, for, for, for uh, this application. So let's go through these uh, uh, steps and, and start with the first ones. So I have the, uh, I'll just stop this one so it's not running. Uh, I have the, the complete Duke application. And let's uh, start with the, uh, with the uh, POM file here. So you can see this one. This is a, a traditional war. Uh, it's on, on, on Jakarta 8. The other thing uh, here is the application is exactly the same as, as you saw in, in the complete uh, the Buddhaduk example. It's just an empty application path. And the actual application is a, a resource with a, a get producing JSON. It's, it, it's it has this add dudes annotation. Uh, I'll get back to that later, but that has to do with the CDI log statement. And it's using an, an EJB here I'm, I'm injecting to, to find the greeting. And this Duke service is a EJB, you can see that by the stateless uh, annotation. So that, that's how we define an EJB, it's add stateless. And this one has injected the repository, and the repository has a, a, a find all method that I'm calling, and then I'm going through all of them and taking the first one. If there aren't any, I, I'll just uh, uh, print uh, undefined. So, and, and the find all method is a uh, Jakarta REST, using the Jakarta REST entity manager, and, and using the, the criteria language to find it in, in Jakarta REST and, and get the, uh, the uh, message uh, or the greeting from the database. So, so, and, and the, the Duke's greeting is my entity. So, so you can see the entity, uh, entity annotation, and it's in a table called greeting. It has an, an ID message and email. And so, so that's, that's all, all there is about it. The CDI extension is more kind of a, a specialized thing. Not, not many people actually write CDI extensions, so it's kind of for the special interest. But this is typically how you do it in the, in the old uh, portable extensions to, to observe for, for uh, annotation, for example, and then pick it up and print something in this case, or do something more advanced in a more real world case. So that's my application. So let's do the, the migration. The first thing I'm going to do is to take this one and bump it up to, to nine. 
or I'm actually going to use 9 of 1. So it's updated. And the first thing you notice here is that it starts getting compilation errors. And that is uh, all the, 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 the JavaX uh, things aren't compiling anymore because they are, they're not there. So, so now I can go ahead and just search and replace manually, or I can use this uh, refactoring thing in, in IntelliJ and just use Java to Jakarta E, take the complete Duke application, and run this uh, refactoring. Just do it. And there we go. It's done it for me. So that's all it's all, all about. So don't, don't be afraid of this Java X to Jakarta. It's just one click in the ID and you're done. So, but there are some more steps there. There are some, some XML uh, schema namespaces. And, and we, we, we did the, the change from, from Java X to Jakarta. At the same time, we, we wanted to change the XML namespaces. And, and there are not necessarily that many XML uh, 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 files in your, in your application, but you may have some, for example, persistent XML. And, and the change here is from the old jcb.org namespace to uh, a, a new one. And what we did was to, first of all, we go HTTPS, and we re replaced uh, uh, the, the jcb.org with jakarta.ee. So, so that's the, the, the change we did. So you also need to change the, the location here, like, like this, let me see. This is where I usually type wrong in this demo, so if I do it, I'll just shout out and I'll fix it, hopefully. So you, you notice I'm doing everything manually here, and of course you would probably do a search and replace uh, or a script to do this. Another thing in, in, in Jakarta is that we've always used the, the version name in, in the schema definition file, so it's easy to see which version you're actually using. And, and now we can see it, it validates here, and it says, hey, you, you, you're saying you're using version 2.1, but you're actually version 3.0. So, and, and this is something you need to do with all the, the XML files you have, if you have a Beans XML, a Web XML, or whatever XML in your application. If it's in the jcb.org namespace, you need to change it to Jakarta E namespace. And you can find it all at jakarta.ee slash schemas. There you can find a list of all the schemas. Yes, a question. This is not a core profile, but, but it would, would apply to core profile as well. You show that it uses EGB and JPA, which is not part of the core profile. It's not profile. a part of yeah, core profile. This is part of the okay. web profile. It's yeah. relevant also for the core profile, what you're showing. Yes, yeah, so this is for web profile. Yeah. OK, thanks. So, so and, and, you, and you can see it's, it's about web profile, by, by, by it, it's, using, it's actually using the, the, the full profile. I could have used uh, web API here, but it's using, using the entire platform API. So when I've done the, 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 um, the uh, uh, namespace changes, the other thing is, is the property files. So, so I may have properties here and there that are prefixed with JavaX. And this applies to Spring applications as well. If you have, like, for example, uh, cacheable for Hibernate, is JavaX uh, something cacheable mode uh, or strategy? And, and in my case, I, had, I only have uh, two properties defined, and these are for, for Jakarta persistence. So I have the JavaX persistence, which is now Jakarta persistence, and, and the same for this property. And this is what I use to, to generate the, the test data for, for my, my uh, demo app here. So these are the only the only properties I have, but you may have properties somewhere else in your application that you need to fix. Then this is the fifth one, bootstrapping files. What's that? Yeah. Here it's, there, there are some, some bootstrapping files here and there in, in Jakarta EN. And the one I'm using is the, the one to activate the CDI extension. And CDI extensions are activated by a file called uh, Java X Enterprise SBI extension, where you have the fully qualified uh, path for your CDI extension. And it's not hard to guess that this file needs to be renamed. So the renaming here is for, for, uh, for JavaX to Jakarta. So, so we're, we are very uh, consistent, uh, consistent in, in doing this. The last step uh, about verified data and dynamic contents, I'll show that uh, when we start the application. So I've now uh, done all, all the migration steps. 
So the next step I'm going to do is, is just start up uh, Glash v6, which is a Jakarta 9 server. And then I'll, I'll deploy the application to, to this one. So the complete the there we go. And I'll go and deploy it. Why can't I deploy it? I won't deploy, why? I'll do it again. So Glassfish is running. Artifacts. We have the complete the core. It should be this one. Let's see. Okay. I haven't seen this before, but it won't let me deploy. I'll try the exploded one. Artifacts. There's always something, isn't it? It won't let me deploy. I, I'm not sure what's uh, going on here, uh, to be honest. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, da, 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 da. Just make sure it's refreshed. Everything. So I'm not sure about why it won't let me uh, deploy. I'll just start it again. Let me see. It is compiled, yes. So I'm just wondering why it won't. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll just move on and and um, I'll I'll demo the application in 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 the next uh, step. So so let's say okay, I couldn't run it on on six. Let's let's go go ahead and and do this uh, on on ten rather. So so I'll I'll just upgrade it it to Jakarta ten. It, it's um, it's uh, very much the, the, the same as 9. So, so I'll upgrade it to, to 10. The next step I, I'm going to do is to, uh, since I'm now running on 10, I, I need a, a Beans XML file. So, so, so I'll add the, the Beans XML. And you can look at the Beans XML that uh, this one is it's an empty Beans XML on, on uh, CDR4. So when I've added a, a Beans XML file, I should be able to I'll stop this one and start it. Start uh, Glass with 7, which is Jakarta 10. And let's just go ahead and, um, and see if it deploys here. So there we have the deploy step. So just bear with me there. It's, uh, I don't know why it, 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 it wouldn't go on. on on, on six, but but uh, uh, Jakarta ten is, is essentially the same. This, you see, the only thing I had to do was to add the bin XML file, which is actually a good idea to have in in Jakarta nine as well, and, and just specify it as annotated. Now it can be em empty, and you can see the, the the annotation goes there. The application uh, is now on localhost. I think it's on eighty eighty. Complete the, and it says, uh, "How did you call E8?" And and this is where the dynamic things comes in. Uh, you may have uh, in in this case, it's just a message saying, "Hello, it's Jakarta E8." While we are on nine or ten, but but the the uh, the dynamic uh, st uh, st stuff could be something else. You may be building some properties. You may be concatenating strings to make Java X something. Or reading something from a database, building some strings, and, and doing reflection on some classes, which is on the Java X namespace. So this is kind of the dynamic things uh, comes in. So so let's just go in 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 the database. Let's see if I can find it here. Yes, uh, let's get rid of this one. And you can see in the greeting table, if I go and uh, look at the data, you can see the data says uh, how did you call E8. So, so now I can go in here and, and say, how did you call the E10, which was we're actually running on? And I should be able to, uh, to submit this uh, somewhere. There you go. And, 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 and now the, the, uh, the message should be Jakarta E10. So, so this is how you kind of do this. Um, uh, the, the dynamic uh, data is that you may have to do something that is not in your code, it could be in your application somewhere else. 
So what I'm going to do now is, is just to, to remove these two, uh, uh, the, the, these two uh, uh, properties. Uh, so, so I want to generate a, a uh, new Jacobi 8 in, in the table. And y you may have noticed as well that I'm, I'm running on Jacobi 8. And who's, who's using 8 nowadays? 11, 17, yeah. 20. Yeah. So let, let's upgrade this one to use at least 17. So I'll up upgrade this to 17. And, and since I'm using 17, I can now use uh, uh, features from, from, from 17. And let's add a record. So, so I'm, I'm going to add this and call it Duke greeting record, just to be very clear. And this record should have a string message and a local date, uh, local date, date. So I have these, these two, two uh, uh, properties of, of, of my record. And then you may notice here that what I'm doing here is I'm returning the database entity through my REST API, and, and uh, JSON binding is, is doing uh, its magic to create the, the uh, JSON output for me. But what I, I don't want to really expose my database entity to uh, the, the API. So, so a, a common practice is to use a, a DTO or, or value ob object in between, and, and records are, are perfect for that, that approach. So rather than it, uh, returning a Duke's greeting here, let's uh, return the record. And when, when I return this record, I need to fix the, the business logic of, of my application to also return a uh, record. And here I can do, when, when I've found the first one from the database, uh, uh, then I can, I, I can do a mapping from uh, the entity I found in the database to a uh, Duke's greeting record. And I can take the message and uh, Rather than email, I'll just take a uh, local date now. And I'll, I'll do the same for if I don't find anything in the database, I'll hard code this to, to also to, to just high and local date now. So, so now I have a, a business logic here that, that is converting the, the object to a record rather than returning the database entity. So if I do go to my Glassfish here and redeploy the application, it should now, now return uh, the uh, record. Now you can see it's a date and a message rather than an email and a message. So I'm returning the, the right stuff. So you see, you can use Jacardi 7 with uh, Jacardi 10. You can use it with 9 as well. So let's, let's do the, the, the Spring uh, example. And this is actually a scenario 4 of a of, of a, another talk when I only uh, focus on Spring, so that's what, why it's called Scenario 4. And that is to upgrade a Spring application, and this Spring application has uh, two dependencies. It, it has one dependency that, that I have the source code for, and it has a library that I don't have the source code for. So what I'm going to do is to take this one from Spring Boot 2 and move it over to Spring Boot 3 and see what Jakarta ha uh, EE has to do with it. And as I said, for the Duke dependency, I have the source code. For the Duke library, I don't have the source code. It's some library I have gotten somewhere, or we have thrown away the source code, or it's not maintained anymore, or, or for some reason, it, 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 I just don't have the source code anymore. And, and this application, I'll just stop this glass fish so I don't get port conflicts. So it, this application is a, it's called uh, Duke Boot. And as you can see here, it's generated with, um, with the, the Spring initializer. It's using uh, Spring uh, 278. And it has these two dependencies, a Duke app and a Duke lib. And it has the in-memory database. Uh, the the uh, logic of this application is, uh, first of all, this is a configuration. It's a Spring Boot application. The, the logic, it, it has a post and a get method. And the post uh, takes in a, a user. It validates it using bean validation. Right? And, and it just creates an account and stores the account in the database using the account repository. And it has a getter to, to get all 
uh, is assess users it actually uh, accounts, but it, it just finds everything from the account repository. And, and these are the only two classes I have here, because the, in the, the, the account stuff is in my uh, Duke dependency. Uh, and the Duke dependency has the, the uh, account entity, which you can see it's a Java X persistence, it's Jakarta persistent entity. Uh, it, and, and it has um, the, the repository, which is a Spring Data repository, so, uh, which is using uh, JPA underneath. And, and the other stuff, the user stuff, that comes from my, 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 um, uh, from, from the um, Duke lib, which I don't have the source code for. Right, so, 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 so this one, um, uh, you can see it comes from the Duke lib. So, so, so I don't really know what's going on there, but uh, I, I can guess that it has a user and it has some, some stuff around it. So let's just run this application first. And I'll just run it. I have compiled it before I uh, started here. So I'm starting it up. And I can now uh, go uh, and, and just query the users. It says there are no users there yet. So I can do a, a, a post to it. So I post a, a user that has the email duke at dukes.se, which is a Swedish domain. It says user is valid. The, the, it, it, I get a HP 200, so everything looks fine. Uh, let's uh, try to query the users. You can now see I have a user here. You can see in, in the Duke boot application, it says the user was created with, uh, with ID 1. And what I'm going to do is now to, to, to try to add a user that doesn't have a valid email. And you can see I, I now get a 400, a bad request. So, so it validates that the user has a valid email address. So that's something that happens in Duke lib. Uh, and you can now see that it, it didn't add anything. I still have one user. So this is the, the logic of this application. It's not, not that, that uh, fancy, but, but it, it does uh, what it's supposed to. So let's take this one and migrate it up to, um, uh, to uh, Spring Boot 3. So I'll take this one and just I'll, I'll give it the 3 to 1. So what you'll see there is that it seems to work fine, except the, oh, the validation didn't go. So, so here I can actually, I can do the same uh, refactoring as I did. But uh, for this case, since it's only one, let's just do uh, Jakarta validation. And you see, it, it compiles. So this is what you have to do when you upgrade from Spring with 2 to 3 is to fix these Jakarta namespace. It's usually just the, the, the annotations. So let's try to, to, to uh, build this one. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop it. There we go. Maven clean package. So you can see now that it's failing. Because I have some dependencies that are using some stuff. And if you remember from the, from the, the Duke dependency, uh, it has this uh, uh, Java X stuff. So this one probably needs some updates as well. So let's go and, and find, yeah, this one is using Spring with 2 as well. So it should be on, on 3 to 1 as well. So I'll, I'll create the, 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 uh, the Spring with dependency. And let's just compile it and, and see if it works. So, so this is the, the Duke day. And this one has to be in my Maven repository since it's consumed by the other one. So uh, I'll also, before I do that, I'll create a new version of it. Because this is version 1 of 0, and I want this new version to be uh, version uh, 2. So let's open the terminal again. There we go. Let me see. Uh, there. So I'll take a clean install. Uh, and, and now you see it, 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 it oh, this was the Duke boot. Uh, that was uh, not the one I was planning to do. It was the Duke dependency. So I'll do a clean install here. And, and what you see there is that uh, it, it actually uh, went fine. That was a, a little bit surprising. But um, uh, if I now take the, uh, the Duke boot, so bear with me there. It's a little bit back and forth. The Duke boot, 
and I update this one to, to not use version 1.0 of the Duke dependency, but version 2.0, the one I just created. Right? So I, I've created a new version of, of the dependency that I'm now consuming. So let's uh, uh, build it here. And you can see it still fails. So what happened? I upgraded it to 3.1, and, and I did all the stuff, but it still fails. Well, there is actually something, and the, and the Duke dependency is also generated by the Spring Starter. And since it's using the, the data stuff, it's using Jakarta Persistence API and Jakarta Validation. And these are the Jakarta E8 versions of them. So what you need to do is to figure out what are the versions that are in Jakarta E9 or 10 and, and use this one. Uh, and uh, usually you can, you can go for the latest one, or you can go to jakarta.ee.specifications and, and find the versions. But here it's, it's uh, version 3 and, and 3.02. So, so you see you, ha you may have some Jakarta dependencies in your Spring application as well. So you need to check your POM XML and make sure uh, you have everything. So I go back and I reinstall my Duke dependency into my Maven repository. Oh, uh, yeah, so now I get compilation errors when I do that, because since I changed the dependencies, I now have the namespace I need to change. And here, there are so many. So in this case, I'll just use the, the migration from, from Java to Jakarta E. So you can see you can do that on, on a Spring application as well, and do the same refactoring as I did, and it will fix uh, the compilation errors for me. When I've done that, I can go and install my uh, Duke dependency. It installs fine. Uh, let's see if, if the Duke boot uh, uh, compiles. So I compile the Duke boot application, and everything looks fine. So, so far, so good. Let's run it and see if, um, uh, if uh, it, it works as expected. Because when it compiles, uh, it's usually uh, good, isn't it? So, so that, that's usually how I test stuff. If it compiles, then it's fine. So n it runs. Good. L let's try and, and insert something in the database. So I'll just get this up. And I'll insert, start with the happy case first. I'll in insert the valid email address. You see, yeah, it's inserted. It, it's writing the ID one came out. Uh, I, I can do the get users. You can see I find the user. Let's try the one with a, a wrong e email address. Let's use the one without the at sign. And you can see it went fine. But this got a validation error pre previously. What's happening? This is a runtime stuff that just sneaks in, in you. You don't, no warning is in the IDE, nowhere else. And part of it is because I don't have tests. But the, with the other thing, you can see it actually created an item for me. And in my, my uh, list in the database now, you can see I have two items in the database. And now I have crap in the database because the validation didn't kick in. This is the kind of uh, things that, that uh, could happen. And this is all to do to the Duke lib. So wh what can we do about that? Well, th there is something. Remember, I talked about transformation. So let's try that. Uh, and, and transform uh, these. So, and, and to do that, um, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to copy the uh, Dukelib 1.0 from my Maven repository out here. So now I have the, the Dukelib here. And then I, I'm, I'm going to use one of these tools, the Eclipse Transformer or the Apache Tomcat migration tool, to transform this jar. And I'll use the, the Eclipse Transformer. And I've downloaded that file. And the way you, you, you use this one, is the uh, jar, uh, and it's uh, somewhere. Yeah, it's uh, I downloaded it to a tools folder. You can see I'm using the transformer CLI 050 jar, and the input parameter is the, the jar that I want to transform. And it, it, it runs. And now you can see I have two files. I have the output duke, and I have the, the duke lib. So let's look at these two files. So I'll, I'll unzip the. Duke lib uh, to the old directory, and I'll unzip the till to the new directory. So now I have uh, two directories here under the temp folder, which is uh, new and old. 
So if I look at the old folder, you can see the user I have here has the add email annotation on the field. And this add, e uh, uh, add email comes from Java X validation. And that's why it isn't uh, picked up, because Spring Boot 3 runs on Jakarta namespace. It doesn't see this when it scans for it. So, but after the transformation in the new folder, this user now are using the newer version of the Jakarta validation of the email. So now I've transferred from uh, this jar. So the next thing I, I, I have to do is to uh, re-release this one. Uh, so so I'll, I'll just Maven, no, I have to go one folder down. Um, uh, Maven, uh, I'll Maven install. So, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm running the Maven install install file, and uh, I'm taking the output Duke 100. I'm using the same artifact ID, group ID, but I, I'm using version 2.0. So I'm, I'm installing this into my local uh, Maven repository. And, and you can see here under the, the, uh, the Duke, um, Duke lib that I now have two versions there. So what, what, uh, the next step I'm, I'm going to do is to, to uh, update my POM file of the uh, Duke boot application to use version 2.0. And when I've done that, I can uh, recompile it. I can go ahead and uh, run it. And if I now do a duke.se, was fine. I take duke, bad request. And the, uh, the, the, the users are now the only one created. So that's now my application has been uh, fixed. So I used the, the migration tool, and what I did was to upgrade my dependencies. I used two different techniques for them. One, I had the source. One, I didn't have the source. So this is how you can do a, a spring migration. And you can see the steps for this are very similar to the ones for Jakarta E. It's the version in the POM. It's the Jakarta E versions in the POM. It's fixed the imports, repeat for dependencies, transfer libraries if you need to. And you also may have to do these uh, prefixes if you have Java X properties here and there, and dynamic content if you have that. So it's very similar for the Jakarta e application and the Spring application. So I have 38 seconds left, so let's move on to Jakarta e 11 and what to expect there. We're, we're trying to tie the release cadence of, of Jakarta e to the Java SE release cadence of the LTSs. So when the LTS comes out, about six months after we want to release Jakarta e uh, uh, next version. So uh, the next LTS is in September this year, so that means in Q1, Q2 next year, we want to release Jakarta E11. And 11 will build on Java SE 21 as a runtime. The APIs will probably be compiled on 17 or 21. And, uh, but we're making sure that the TCK runs on 21. Jakarta config is a specification that may or may not make it into the, the application, uh, the Jakarta E11, probably not. But Jakarta config is, is to, to make environment uh, uh, aware uh, configuration. So you can uh, kind of have at, uh, some annotation in your file or, or in, in your source code and, and pick it up from Kubernetes or, uh, or whatever environment you're running in. And you don't have to re rebuild your application. Jakarta MVC is probably not going to make it to the web profile, even though we, we kind of hope it, since I'm the, the project leader of that one. Uh, it's adding the MVC pattern to the uh, Jakarta REST, so you have a couple of annotations on top of REST. So if you know Jakarta REST, it's very easy to learn in Jakarta MVC. And when servers are rendering is back in a year or two, then this will be here waiting for you. Jakarta NoSQL is standardizing integration with NoSQL database. You may have seen Otavio's presentation yesterday. Uh, Jakarta RPC is a new specification that standardized uh, gRPC is probably not going to make it to 11. Jakarta Data is a specification we really hope we will get into to, uh, uh, 11. In, and if you're in the spring world, you know spring data. It's cool. It's a fancy technology. We want the same, so we're copying what you have. And we're proud of it. And we hope to get uh, Jakarta EE there to standardize the repository pattern for data access. So to sum up, Jakarta 9 is actually the one that created this ripple in the ecosystem, and that was the namespace switch. 
and that is Java X to Jakarta. It can be hard, it can be easy. It's not that hard if you do it step by step and carefully and analyze what you're doing. And the Jakarta 10 platform, it's a lot of new stuff. The uh, new child on the block is Jakarta Core Profile. It's a smaller set of specifications. Jakarta 10 is compiled with 11, but it runs on 11 and 17, so you can use 17 as your runtime. For more information about Jakarta E, it's jakarta.e. You can also find a starter there similar to the Spring Initializer, so you can uh, create a, a sample project from, from scratch. Uh, we have the Jakarta Blogs Aggregator, where, where content is produced about Jakarta E. I write the weekly hashtag Jakarta E on, on my blog. The demo code is in the Jakarta E Duke repository on my GitHub. Search for Jakarta E Duke, and I promise you this is the only one you'll find. And if you want to learn about Jakarta E and have a LinkedIn account, try out the new Jakarta E Overview LinkedIn course. And with that, I thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I have two pairs of socks. So first one asking a question, get a pair of socks. Yes? Definitely not, not because of the socks, but still I would take them. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it there. But uh, you, uh, j uh, the, the reference implementation is still uh, Glassfish, right? For the Jakarta. The the sorry, the, the reference implementation, the RI, is still Glassfish, right? Yes, we don't have a reference yeah. implementation. We have lots of compatible implementation. Glassfish is one of them. Okay. But we don't have a special one. Okay, because I maybe missed this because you didn't show this on the core profile uh, compatible no, implementation. No, it, it hasn't passed the TCK for core profile. It, w it could, but it hasn't. Okay, thanks. Yes, and in more socks, yes? Where can you get the slides? You can get the slides on speaker deck. I'm sure uh, J Prime will uh, put them out, and I'll tweet them right after, uh, later tonight. Awesome, you get a pair of socks.